Great afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special Google Hangout, a live Q&A with John Buchanan from Buchanan Success Coaching, who will be joining us today to answer all of your questions. My name's Emma Monroe, and if you would like to ask any questions live of John, um, please tweet us. Um, the hashtag is QA with John Buchanan, and, um, or you can leave a um, YouTube or Google Plus message just below this video. So let's get started and meet John. Great afternoon, John. Welcome to your very first Google Hangout on Air. Hello, Emma. Hello, everybody out there. Yes, amazing. Here we go, hanging out. Here we are. <laughs> now, you may notice that there's a, if you've clicked play um, and opened up the Showcase app, there's a couple of links to the right of your screen um, with some links through to John's website. Now, there's a great little report in that third one down, which is 12 quick tips for high performance um, business coaching. Um, so make sure you click on that and you'll be able to download that from John. Um, there's another couple of links in there that we'll go over later. So John, can you give us an update? Um, you know, people know you, obviously, um, from your illustrious career. Can you fill people in on exactly what you've been up to over the last few years with um, the corporate work that you're doing? Yes, thanks, Emma. Look, um, I suppose I realised my time in cricket was coming to an end uh, around about the 2007 mark, we had a World Cup uh, in the West Indies at that stage and I guess I always felt that um, I wanted to make a transition from what I've been doing in sport um, into the corporate world because I just believe there's so many things that uh, I guess I was exposed to by way of a team environment, by way of dealing with individuals, by way of dealing with uh, some of the questions today, lots of changes that uh, are outside of your control and then how do you cope with those. So it was really then thinking about all that and um, putting it into some sort of shape that I believed I could then provide those lessons back to either individuals or back to businesses and teams um, outside the sporting world. Not necessarily um, mutually exclusive of uh, because obviously the same sort of things exist within the sporting world, sporting organisations and leaders and coaches and so on. But I just felt that the principles in behind what I had learned um, are very uh, transferable to all sorts of industry. Absolutely, and obviously um, your clients agree with you, which is fantastic from the results that you've been seeing, but we'll go into that in a little bit later. Um, what are you hoping to contribute to the audience um, that are investing their time to watch this today? Look, well, just that, I mean, obviously there's some interesting questions there, and. Um, I guess there's always plenty of interesting questions about either one, how do you make your, your business grow, how do you uh, deal with lots of challenges that, that are confronting you uh, daily, and then as a, the manager or the leader, you know, how do you cope with that yourself, and then how do you cope with the people within your organisation and hopefully um, you know, get them to grow along with you. So uh, I guess that's what I'm hoping I can assist people with there today, that they've got some, some questions and maybe we can explore some answers. I don't profess to sit here and know every, every possible answer. I don't think that uh, that's possible. But, but hopefully in our conversations we, we do explore some of the ideas or at least maybe even reinforce a lot of the things that people are doing out there now currently. Absolutely, and we've been running um, a little bit of a campaign on Twitter over the last few weeks um, with the hashtag QA with John Buchanan. So thank you for all of those that have submitted their questions. Um, so one of them that has come through, John, is if there are new rules put upon your industry which create a lot of change within your industry, do you have any advice on leading your team through that change? Yes, yeah, so well, look, um, I guess one of the first rules is that obviously change is inevitable no matter what industry uh, we operate in. Um, and so I guess that's, that's the constant. So um, the second part of that is, and, and certainly experience that I had a lot in sport, there are a lot of things that, that sit outside your control, whether they be rules, regulations, whether they be weather, whether they be travel schedules, whatever it might be. And we always found, I suppose, that we could be distracted by those uh, sorts of interruptions. And uh, so it really became important to understand pretty clearly what um, the fundamentals of, of what it is that we do and what it is that we do is what we own, what we personally own. So when we're confronted with, with change, 
it's what we we control rather than what we don't control. So coming back into uh, you know the sporting environment or the individual themselves, what how do I respond? You know, what are the basics for me that, that I know that I can do, and if I do those things pretty well, uh, then at least gives me a, a fighting chance to deal with what some of the changes are that I'm about to try to deal with. Uh, from a sporting sense, um, and I think this is where we can make the transition across the business, you know, we, we segment uh, the things that we controlled into four or five different areas. One would be our technical skills. So if we looked into your business or I looked into my business that I currently run or indeed looked into a sporting business, what are the, the, the skills that I have that enable me then to do the job that I currently do and hopefully the, the job that I currently do to the best of my ability. So what are those technical skills? And, and you're always trying then to make sure that they not only are in line with delivering uh, on uh, your business, delivering high quality service to your customers and your clients, but also trying to understand, well, where is this marketplace potentially going? And so we talk a little bit about the change. Um, so in a sense, a little bit of crystal balling, a little bit of research and trying to understand, well, where this market is going and therefore have I got all the skills in my business or in myself? If I haven't, how do I upskill or what sort of people or, or um, contractors or resources do I need to bring into the business? Another segment would be around our physical skills. Sorry, Emma, you were going to... I was going to ask a question, a follow-up question to that then is... Um, are you a proponent then for preparing for the unexpected and training for the yeah. unexpected? Well, obviously, what you're trying to do is make sure that your, your preparation in, in whatever you're going to do is the best possible. So part of your preparation then is looking at contingencies. You know, if, if we do X and um, we head down that path and then suddenly there's a, some sort of disruption to that path, well, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to deal with so, yeah, it's trying to, when you set about your planning, which therefore leads your preparation, hopefully we've kind of looked at every possible scenario. But that, again, that's not possible. That's the whole point. I mean, if it was possible, then you feel like you're in control of your, your own destiny all the time, but that's just not possible. So uh, what is what is important then is when we find those things that are suddenly outside of what we had thought about, well, now it's back to those fundamentals. What are, we, what are our basics? What do we do well? Let's make sure that we deal with those, uh, which will give us the best chance to get through whatever this um, interruption will be into where we, you know, where we're basically trying to get to. So, so yeah, the other bits were around the physical side. Obviously, we're in a you know physical industry, if you like, or a physical career, so sports. So we're always making sure that our physical skills were good. I think the next one is really important for anybody in business, particularly the leaders, um, and that's around your mental skills. And your mental skills. If I could just summarise around decision making. So, how can I, when I'm faced with those um, things that interrupt my day? So, I, you know, we can all be talking as we were doing before, and suddenly the the, uh, the internet drops out. You know, when you you're right in <laughs> in the middle of a, a hangout. Uh, so, you know, right then and there, I've got to make some good decisions, hopefully, to deal with that and, and get things back on track. So. You know, in a sporting sense, that's constantly happening. So every moment, when you're in those moments, you're trying to win the moment. And to win the moment means you need a clear head. So your mental skills are really around just your ability to think clearly. How do I do that? You know, what's my routine at that time to let myself, you know, let myself think clearly? Um, the next set is around your tactical skills. So we've kind of mentioned that already. So your tactical skills is, is really your risk minimisation. It's, it's a risk analysis of the situation that you're going into, uh, but that risk uh, analysis is, is kind of based on a whole lot of research, both internally and externally, um, so that you you then, when you're required to make a decision, you know you've got a menu there, your smorgasbord of, of options. Uh, the clear mind will hopefully allow you to pick what might be the best option for that moment. And then the, the last little segment is around if you operate in a team environment, what are the team skills that we need to enable us to you know, deal with those changes? Because, again, within any team, even though there seems to be things outside your control, it's incredible the experience, the knowledge, and the intuition that resides within the group. 
and uh, while you as a leader manager may not have the answer, there may very well be uh, an answer provided either by one or two or a collective um, uh, sort of problem solving exercise by the group. Absolutely. Something that you were just saying just before, John, reminded me of an Anthony Robbins quote, which is, um, business is only 20% mechanics, but 80% psychology. So when you're talking about your mental fitness as a leader, what are some of the things you do yourself and that you teach other leaders to do to put into their day to um, support their mental fitness? Um, well, again, I suppose reinforcing what I just said before or reiterating what I said before. Um, to me the mental side is, is just your routines um, and so we're having a conversation right at the moment um, and, and other people are listening right at the moment. I don't feel like I've got any great distraction going on. In other words, I'm sitting in this moment right now and I think um, that's a pretty important skill to ensure that you nurture and develop and understand what it is for yourself. Um, if I throw back into the, the sporting lessons again, um, the reason why very, very good or great players I think are as good as they are is that they have this incredible capacity to, to, to compartmentalise their life, if you like, or, or the, where they're currently at. You know, mental, uh, Stephen Wall, uh, his famous quote uh, for those who are listening to us may not know who Stephen Moore is, but Stephen Moore was uh, one of Australia's cricketing captains, one of their famous leaders of a very, very successful team. Um, but he would always say that mental toughness is giving 100% attention to the moment and then repeating that and repeating that and repeating that. So one of the secrets is this ability to switch in and switch out. Um, so you hear people sort of talking about wonderful concentration. You know, how do people concentrate in this game called cricket which goes over such a long period of time? Well the fact is that they don't. What they do very well is that capacity to switch in when they need to in those critical moments uh, where they need to make a good decision and then have the capacity to understand when that moment's finished to get out of that, get away from that and I suppose rest the mind rather than trying to actually have it fixed for a long period of time because I think there's plenty of research around to say that you know, the, the length of concentra concentration or the length of your ability to focus your attention for a you know, high intensity period is only very short so we need to understand that and need to give it a rest and then need to be able to zero it in on, on those critical moments again when required. I love that terminology, John, of switch in and switch out. Um, it just makes it, for a visual person, um, very clear um, for that focus. So thank you for that. Um, now there's another question that's come in, John, which is um, how would you deal with one team member who is constantly um, causing disharmony but who adds a lot of value? Now for someone that works with um, a lot of teams, um, you know, there's always one, let's face it. <laughs> um, yeah. But ha how do you suggest in the business world that um, a leader deals with that? Sure. There may be more than one too, of course. Um, <laughs> but look, um, I think the first first thing to understand from a business point of view is, is where do you want to take your team? You know, where do you, what's your picture, what's your vision for your team? Um, and I guess where I come from is, and, and to some degree, an assumption of mine, May, or may be incorrect sometimes, is that uh, we really want to be a high performance team at the end. We really, no matter what that marketplace is that we operate in, we want to be the market leader. And not only do we want to be the market leader, but we actually want to stay there. You know, we just want to dominate the market. We, we really want to, uh, in inverted commas, squash the opposition. We want to keep them out of the, the game. And, uh, and so what enables you to do that, uh, there's a whole range of which we talk about high performance teams and some of that is in the tips that I mentioned. But, um, well, that you mentioned, I should say. Um, but one of those things is around your skill base, around your talent, around the people who work for you, the people who play for you. And so if you want to be high performance, if you want to dominate your marketplace, you've got to have what I might term game changers in there. You've got to have people who, by virtue of their skill, uh, just outstanding and as you say they deliver incredible value and you see that in all 
areas, don't you? Wonderful Absolutely. salespeople, great, great stockbrokers, incredible lawyers, um, fantastic people with, with figures, might be actuarials or whatever. So, so you need those people, but of course, they're, they're so good at what they do that they become quite demanding, you know, that they have their own strong egos, they have their own um, desire to be the centre of attention because of who they are. And so uh, that does present interesting dynamics within a, within a team framework when you're all trying to, in a sense, do the same thing. But I, firstly, I think, um, understand that that's still really important because, again, while we might not all have game changers and those who are going to do something outstanding that few other people can do, you still need all people in your organisation to be what I call your own best coach. So, so they've got to understand how they play well how they sell well, how they market well, how they um, deliver a, a speech well. Um, so therefore, to do that, um, they, as I said, they need to know, going back to those little segments before, technically, physically, mentally, tactically, when I play well, when I perform well, when I do whatever it is I do well, what, what do I do? You know, what do I do? So, so the, the game changer, just is so demanding because you know once they're into what they're doing, that's their stage. That's where they can show people just how good they are, not only internally but externally. So as I said, that does present some interesting dynamics. But all I'm firstly saying is you need those people, and um, you need them to, to to manage them. To manage them um, as a, as the leader, the manager, the coach. Certainly, there's a relationship there that has to be struck. Now, you know, um, I could go back to my situations with someone like a Shane Warne, um, and uh, he was just one of those great game changers. One of these people that had an incredible ability to compartmentalise the game and just play in his cricket compartment and deliver incredible skills on the field. Just an amazing player. Um, but at certain stages, you know, what he was demanding was outside, if you like, um, the team uh, culture or outside the, the way that the team's values might sit. So on some occasions, it would be up to the leader to, to manage that. Um, on other occasions, and probably the most uh, preferential approach, would be to be managed by his peers. So in other words, you had people strong enough in their personality and their character that if someone like a Shane Warne or whoever it might be uh, stepped outside the parameters of the team, then it was the team who then did the disciplining, if you like, of the individual. That's the most powerful means of keeping that maverick, that, that high performer, that game changer within the confines of a group, yet still allowing that person to deliver what they want to do. Um, so, John, would you... Would you to foster that um, peer group and that, you know, the strength of the peer group, um, obviously that comes from culture. So the leader would, you know, create a culture around that and then let the peer group um, manage, almost manage itself in that sort of situation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Look, um, and it's, an, it's a real interesting play because that's, um, you know, often leaders, managers, coaches all feel like, They've got to make all the decisions. They've got to be in control of every situation. And indeed, I kind of subscribe to that. But for me, the control um, should be far more subtle. It should be vested in the, the players, the people within your team to administer the culture, the written rules and regulations, and the unwritten rules and regulations, so that the key values of that team might be a you know, continual improvement or hard work or you know uh, being professional, whatever those uh, sorts of value sets that reside within that group are, then really they've got to deliver that. And so in a sense, the leader, if they're doing their job well, becomes quite invisible um, you know, and, and really stands back and, and above and around all that and is just monitoring the that sort of progress. Interestingly though, because things work one day, it certainly doesn't mean they're going to work the next day, um, or indeed vice versa if it's not quite working one day. 
it, it doesn't take too much to turn that around, provided that the leader understands what it is that they're trying to achieve, who are who within that group are their real key allies, um, and so through the close relationship with some people within that bigger group, the leader, manager, coach has a capacity then to infuse without necessarily having to invoke um, the sorts of um, actions and behaviours that are required to maintain the culture and then continue to improve the culture, which if that's there, will manage those maverick people. Excellent. You've got some gems today. Thank you so much, John. With um, just that last line that you just talked about, infuse versus invoke, like that's something that a leader can really focus on and really um, infuse into their culture, can't they? Well, they can. I mean, uh, as I said, it's um, it's part of the coaching process, I think, and, and it's it's almost um, hard to do in some industries. Like I've worked a fair bit in the mining industry. That mining industry is really an invoke type of culture. No matter where it sits, whether you're at the top of the tree or, or you're um, you know, at the coal face, literally. Yes. Um, it, it really is one where it's quite um, unheard of for the, the supervisor, the you know the various levels of management, to kind of sit back and do the infusing. It, it's really you know this is the way it is. It's quite structured, and you do this, and, and, and that's. So yeah, we're after these sort of results, and, and it was a, a trade-off, but well, not a trade-off, but that you got uh, virtually getting dirt out of the ground. So you got productivity, and on the other hand, you've got this thing called safety. You know, and, and they yeah. they're both outcomes that they're trying to achieve, but they, they're kind of in conflict with each other. So um, they set rather rigid rules and regulations, which of course some things have to be, but it's how that's done. Um, and it seems to me that more invoking rather than infusing. I think the real good leaders are those who can infuse, uh, can be seen to be invisible and allow things to happen. Excellent. Be seen to be invisible. I like that. <laughs> now, I <Yes>. like... <laughs> um, this next question that's come through on Twitter, and thank you everyone for sending these through, is um, do you have any tips on managing the mindset of your team when they are spread out geographically? Obviously, this is, um, you know, has a lot of relevance to you from your cricketing days, but um, as more and more business gets um, less office bound and more um, outbound, this is um, something that's, you know, obviously of importance to business owners. It is, uh, no question, and um, I suppose the simple answer is always you've got to get close to your people, as close as you can, and of course if they're removed geographically that does present some issues to you. Um, I might say at the same stage that um, some people still feel quite removed from their leadership, even though they might be sitting in the office right next mm -hmm. to them, right adjacent to them. Good point. Um, and I, I, I still think the principle is that you do need to, to be as close as you can to your your staff member, your support person, whoever it might be. Uh, so that means you've got to get to know them. I suppose one of my uh, philosophies in leadership and coaching is around the whole person. So. It was not necessarily about the athlete per se, albeit that you know all the guys uh, wanted to play cricket. That's where their skill sets were, and that's what they wanted to do day in day out. Um, but it just seemed to me if I could get a better understanding of them as a person, uh, maybe their goals in life, maybe something about their family, their partner, maybe some of their other likes outside of the cricket, um, and so have that uh, closer understanding, closer relationship to them around the person that they want to be, if you like, or currently are or aim to be, then I think their cricket life was, was uh, far easier for them to deal with. So that meant you, you, all leaders, all managers, have got to put in the time somehow. Now, whether they're geographically um, relocated from you, then you need your own strategies to do that. And that can be, oh, as we know, that can be on the phone these days. It can be um, in a less personal way than via email or via text um, and so on, but I think that has some limited effect. In the end, it's got to have a richness about it. The individuals have to find ways of connecting face-to-face. -face. Google Hangout is uh, one of those great ways to do it um, <laughs> so that we can actually see each other and talk to each other, you know. Um, but it, it is that richness of, of meeting 
And then, of course, generally when these people are residing uh, elsewhere in the countryside, there are they are working either as little teams there within the bigger framework of the team. So it is about um, making sure that you're connected with other team leaders um, so that they can be, if you like, a, a, a quasi you, you know, somebody who uh, understands your values, your philosophies, but will actually deliver that in their own way, in their own time, in their own words, you know. So, so we just have to be, I think, always mindful that no matter whether the person's sitting next door or whether they're sitting 10,000 miles away, they can still feel quite removed from you unless you give them that time. You you spend wherever you can a, a certain richness with them, uh, an understanding of them as a person. Uh, try to listen to to them as well, whether that be from a work front or whether that be from a, a personal front. The ability to to at least listen and acknowledge that. But it, there's no question. As as uh, you know, we divide up our office and, and people get uh, moved by distance. Then it, it does present us more challenges. But provided we have the principle and need that we we need to to remain in touch and not just say we need to. We actually got to find ways and means of doing that and as consistently as we possibly can. Absolutely, and as you said before, you know, technology like Google Hangouts and um, Skype and um, GoToMeeting, any and whichever you choose, um, you know, that actually, you know, that can add a layer of um, of connection between yeah. head office and leadership and the people on the ground. Yes, exactly. Excellent. Now we have had another question come through which I'm going to follow up with a secondary question straight away, John, which is um, what are your thoughts on accountability? Now you and I have had um, a couple of discussions now about the scoreboard as well. So um, if you want to introduce that into the conversation, certainly that would be great for people to hear about. Sure, sure. Yeah, look, um, I think this is an incredibly uh, interesting area for business. I just think it's one of the areas that uh, if business can begin to get this right, um, it can open up uh, yeah, great growth within within a business and, and certainly growth within the individual. So let me explain. Um, to me, athletes are one of those careers that are the most accountable uh, that I know of. And look, there may be the others, and maybe some of the listeners will, uh, or the audience will know that. Um, you know, salespeople to some degree have this accountability. In other words, accountability means that so a salesperson, they have to produce some numbers on a relatively frequent basis, whether that be daily, weekly, but, but certainly no more than fortnightly. They've got to present you know, numbers that have been given targets and they have to show what they've been doing. Um, athletes, on the other hand, are, are quite similar. They start a week. You know, here we are on a Tuesday, so right at this stage, um, athletes have begun their week in preparation for their next competition, which is the weekend. And part of that preparation is that the trainer, physical trainer, will set them certain measures so that they've got to, they've got to have their physical skills up to scratch to get ready for the weekend. But the, the physio and sports science staff will be all over them and checking injuries and checking this and checking that. And so those measures have to be on track. And then, of course, you've got the coaching staff who are doing exactly the same thing. They're, they're the individual skills and then their uh, team skills need to be on track to deliver the performance that you're looking for on the weekend. So they get all that, they go to the game, and then what happens? You know, same thing, they get measured again. You know, they get measured uh, by, again, the coaches and the trainers and everybody else. They've got all their measures off there. But then there's this big thing that seems, seems to sit right there in front of everybody's eyes called the scoreboard, which tells everybody in a snapshot in time uh, generally something about the individuals and how they're contributing to where the team is at or not at at that point in time of the game. And then, of course, you get you know an update of how the team's going. End of game, there's a the scoreboard, tells you a result. Then we start all over again. The coach and everybody analyse what's happened and put that into the planning process there for the preparation process to get ready for the next game. So athletes are totally performance measured all the time. Now you could say, well, gee, that gives them no opportunity to be to express themselves, to be their own best coach. Another issue, I think, that can happen, but that's around the environments that we talked about and how coaches and leaders operate. But nonetheless, there is still performance measurement going on. Having been involved in, in organisations, both 
having performance appraisals and performance measurements uh, made of me or making them of other people. I just think they're um, terrible the way we go about them uh, because generally they're only done every six months or, or 12 months. And if so that. They, if that, <laughs> there you go. Um, so uh, at that point in time, when you sit down with the individual, and, and most people, I'm sure, know the feeling, oh, another point performance review, you know, like, let's tick the box, let's just get through it. Um, if it's the one related to remuneration, well, maybe I'd better put in a little bit more effort here and make sure that I tick a lot of the right boxes so it gives me the best chance to get uh, my remuneration uh, favourably looked at. But um, really, all we can do in that period of time is maybe remember some highlights, lowlights, and then, you know, what happened in the last week. Uh, so I, I therefore think there is total lack of accountability uh, by all those in that type of system. Really what we are looking for is to create some sort of school board, individual or small team run by a supervisor that measures basically not only uh, result type um, numbers of which, in other, in other words, the quantitative stuff that we can actually put down, but we just talked about culture before and building this high performance team and, and how you contribute to teams and the mental skills, your ability to make good decisions and so on. So there are other measures in there that need to be shown so that an individual gets a better idea of how they're contributing day in, day out, week in, week out to the teams, to the organisation. So, you know, you walk into, say, a, a, a major law firm and, and you meet the the, uh, the ladies at the reception desk. Now, uh, they do a fantastic job, but do they really understand what their contribution is to the overall uh, performance of, of that legal organisation, either on a weekly or not? I suspect not, unless um, you know that they're they're making it up as they go. Um, I would even so, I would even propose, John, that in that situation, in my experience, that Sometimes even the leaders don't recognise how much influence um, that front reception has. Um, yes, totally. Yeah, totally. yeah. Totally. yeah. Um, because uh, again, as you know, when you walk into the, the receptionist at, at a particular organisation, you don't meet the boss. You know, very rarely do you meet the CEO or the chairman of the organisation. So, so therefore, when we go back to this notion of culture and, and leadership culture, that person that receives you tells you everything about the organisation right then and there. And so you want that person making a really good decision on behalf of the organisation. So so in other words, yeah, I think we could do a heck of a lot better in business around this concept of accountability through the medium of something like a scoreboard, which athletes are subject to week in, week out. Absolutely. I um, totally support that proposal and um, I know you, you're working on some um, key projects which um, will provide that to many businesses around the world as well. Yes, yeah, it's some exciting stuff there. Excellent. So um, those that are watching, um, keep updated with John's blog and um, I'm sure he'll um, update you soon. Now, another couple of questions that have come through. Now, we won't get to answer all the questions today because we've got on a strict timeline. Um, but one for you, John, is um, we're, we are planning a big culture change. What steps would you put in place beforehand? Yes, um, it's, it's always interesting. You know, in inverted commas, a culture change. Um, look, I think, the, and, and uh, if people want to take note of this, and, and maybe some of Seen a blog of mine might have already uh, had the opportunity to view it, but there's a terrific um, YouTube from a chap by the name of Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, and uh, I think it's it's a TED um, uh, series, TED, talk. part of TED, yes. TED Talks, um, and I think it put it out in 2009, but it's, it's around the golden circles, around the golden circle, and, and really there are three questions um, that we I guess, uh, deliver in, in business or potentially um, as, as individuals ourselves. And that's around, you know, basically what we do. So what we see, all the outcomes, you know, so sporting team, we get results, we don't get results. That's what happens. You know, we see that the businesses make profits, they don't make profits, whatever. So th they're, some, they're the outcomes. Um, 
And so generally when we talk about uh, a cultural change world, well, we go in and say, well, this is what it's going to be. This is what it's going to look like. Uh, you know, this is the evidence that we'll see, which is fine. And then uh, we will talk a little bit about, well, how are you going to do that? You know, so then we get into our strategies, etc. You know, how this is all going to play out, who's going to do what, etc. But underlying all that is, well, why would we do it? Why do we want to do it? So uh, Cynic talks about just turning that on its head. So we first have got to understand the why. You know, if we want any sort of change, and I guess you know, like everybody's different, but nonetheless, there's got to be some sort of fundamental driving purpose as to why would we want to change? Why would we just keep doing what we're doing? You know, and uh, and so and individuals are different, as I say. So some people will really need a lot of evidence. You know, so to help that why process, well, here's some of the evidence that's suggesting one. Our current marketplace is changing and there's a lot of things going on. So for us to not only survive in this marketplace, but if we want to dominate, well, we've got to do some new things you know, and there's new ways of being. So so they might want some evidence. Others might just want that big picture, you know, like here's the big picture, this is what we look like, you know, whatever. But but why do we want to be part of that? Because, yes, this, is, this really excites me, you know. I mean, others just need direction, you know. They just need direction. Why? What's important to me? Why do I, you know, why do I want to come to work every day? Why do I yeah. want to work for this organisation? So, yes. if, if I think leaders managers can really understand that why component, that's a really tremendous start. And then, and then we go, as Cynic suggests, then we go the other way. So, given the why, well, how are we going to do this? You know, what are those strategies? And again, as I say, I'll, I'll be chopping them up into the, you know, the, the therefore the technical and the physical and then the technical and the team because they're all the the broad, broader strategies, if you like, that run over you to get there. And then finally, the, the what, you know, so what's it going to look like? And rather than um, looking at the whole as bolus change, you know, what, where it's ultimately going to finish up, one of the things I always found was really important was just to try to take it one step at a time. You're just trying to take those little steps because then if you get something right, you get the chance to celebrate that which is so important to reinforce exactly what it is you're trying to do and where you want to go. So take small steps, celebrate the successes and build upon those. Absolutely. And um, they're, they're big questions to ask, but um, definitely worthwhile asking, aren't they, John? They are. They are. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's no question, as we said right at the outset, that the change is around us everywhere. And, uh, and again, the, the, the business has to kind of decide where it wants to play in its marketplace. And I would have thought, uh, like any organisation, while there are some components in what you do that you really need to retain because they are substantial and, and significant to the way that you run your business, um, to make change, if we continue to do the things that we continue to do today, can we expect to be different tomorrow? Somewhere along the line, somebody said, definition of insanity, wasn't it? Absolutely. To, to be changing if you're doing the same thing. So we need to identify that, but, but within that within that process, people, people, and that's really what we're talking about, have got to have a why, they've got to have a, have a fundamental understanding, a fundamental purpose for, for that change. A fundamental driving force. Mm. Absolutely. Now, last question for you, John, and it's from me um, to let our viewers know. What's next for John Buchanan? Uh, what's next? Well, um, I uh, am just embarking on a couple of reviews at the moment uh, in the sporting arena. So uh, one has been uh, recently uh, publicised around rugby league referees, and uh, uh, that one's pretty interesting. I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, necessarily. I, I follow rugby league, but I'm probably uh, not your avid fan. I'm not at every game and watching every moment. Um, but um, I guess my one of my fundamental um, purposes, if you like, or, or motivations, is that I really believe in sport. I really believe in physical activity, not only for the health of the individual, but obviously the health of a nation. The health of a nation could be around uh, just dealing with obesity. It could be around dealing with mental health. It could be around uh, just dealing with isolation. But also, I believe it goes beyond that. You know, Australia for such a long period of time 
and, and it's part of our fabric. Um, always cherishes what it does on the sporting front. It, it sees itself as a um, you know a, a nation of or sports people who can take on the world. So when I look at rugby league, I'm maybe getting a little bit uh, too grandiose here, but referees, if you like, uh, are really integral to delivering a you know a very good product uh, and very good players, a very good game, and and therefore I think it's really important to not only those who are playing the game, but those who maybe aspire to play the game and those who consume the game on field. So yeah, I'm, I'm really really very excited about getting involved in, in something. That is completely different to, to what I've been involved in before. Uh, Business-wise, same thing. Um, really just taking this whole leadership, coaching, and team approach to, to business and hopefully working with, with a number there to improve what they do. And, and really, it's just an, ed, an education process for them and for me at the same stage. And, uh, I'm involved with a, a, you know, a program called Victorian Leaders, uh, which um, you know basically is one of the Queensland leaders, but it's really taking uh, small to medium businesses and providing incredibly uh, good industry expertise to help them grow their business. So, plenty on the horizon. Fantastic. Now, thank you so much for joining us today, John, and um, filling us in on what you've been doing, answering some questions, and letting us know where you're going. Now, Anyone that's watching this live or um, post-production, um, if you would like to find out more about how to work with John, then you can click on the little links to the right or under the YouTube video. Um, and what is your website where people can go to if they don't click on the links, John? Um, www.buchanancoaching.com Excellent. And any last words to the audience before we finalise? No, look, I just think thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing uh, my initial hangout and uh, thanks, Emma, for your moderation and coordination of the morning. I think I've certainly found it enjoyable from this end, so hopefully everybody's found it not only enjoyable but uh, at least education. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, John, for um, your wisdom today. I have taken so many notes, it's not funny, so hopefully the audience has um, enjoyed it as much as I have. So thank you so much for the opportunity for having you on here. And um, as I said before, if you do want to click on the links and connect with John yourself, then feel free to, to do so at buchanansuccesscoaching.com. Excellent. Until next time, everyone, you have a great day. Thanks. Bye.